As the head of sustainability innovation at IKEA, how have you reduced IKEA's contribution to climate change? Yeah, I think in, in quite a few ways. Um, to start with, I was a part of the creating the first people and planet positive strategy uh, for IKEA 2020, 2011. Uh, where climate change was a central part and where we sort of set the foundation for the actions to come for the coming decade and, and until now. Uh, meaning that we wanted to be climate positive by 2030 in, in IKEA. Um, I've also led and developed a business, a new business uh, that we launched, IKEA Clean Energy Services where we sell solar panels and heat pumps, renewable electricity, EV charging stations and so on. And it's now live in 14 countries across the world. Um, I've been very active in the IKEA investment scheme where we invest in wind, solar and forest. So today IKEA owns uh, 575 wind turbines in 17 countries is around 2.3 gigawatt of installation. Um, and we also, and, and that equals to around 1.2 million households in Europe and their consumption. Um, and also we own 255,000 hectares of sort of well-managed forest. Um, I also led the work on the plant-based proteins work in IKEA. So where we sort of replace uh, red meat with plant-based proteins um, to take down the climate impact of uh, uh, the food agenda and also the circular work in IKEA. I led that with um, yeah, everything then from the material development into the business model development and furniture as a service and, and secondhand business models and so on. So prolonging the life of the products which have a big impact on uh, climate change. So those are a couple of examples that I've been part of and, and leading in, in IKEA. What sustainable changes can people expect from brands like IKEA in the future? Yeah, I think personally, uh, to start with, I, I don't think it's enough with sustainable changes. I think that companies need to um, move towards a regenerative uh, business model. But that said, um, if you take the companies that have understood this, uh, and realize that sustainable business is good business and sort of have started and laid out the direction for the future, they mean that they uh, will be in the forefront. Uh, and I think what we can expect from them um, is to lead, lead their industry uh, through advocacy and, and collaboration, uh, not only their own company then, but also the industry they're in. Uh, towards a sustainable transformation and, and sustainable economy, but also to develop products uh, that are sustainable, either in the material choices or uh, products that actively helps the consumer or customer to uh, become more sustainable. Um, they, we can expect them to, to implement uh, new sustainable business models like product as a service and, and uh, secondhand business models. Uh, work with climate, become climate positive or net zero uh, and actively combat climate change. I, I also think they need to be an inclusive business. Uh, I mean, the world is pol polarizing uh, more and more. And I think uh, brands and companies have a big role to play in, in standing up for human rights and the, uh, the vulnerable uh, in society mm. and fight every type of inequality uh, that is out there. Um, and, and of, of course, uh, lastly, but not least, I think they need also to be very active in uh, uh, the startup market and new technologies uh, with innovation and agility, because that's how it will happen. That's how you sort of transform your business and industry in the, in the best way. How can businesses communicate their sustainability standards throughout their supply chain? Yeah, um, I, I, I see there's two main types uh, of standards to be communicated. One is the product related one. And then the second one is the, uh, uh, the more operational one on working conditions and, and um, sort of more the code of conduct part. 
I think the product related standards are normally communicated directly through the purchasing uh, process within with the product documentation and where this suppliers or, or the companies then offer uh, uh, prices, including the sustainable materials into the products. Um, so it's quite a straightforward process. When it comes to the code of conduct, it's also communicated in the same uh, process, but I think it's a bit more complex uh, work because it's it also sort of con contains a lot of cultural and societal uh, uh, dimensions into it. And if you want to be successful in building a sustainable uh, supply chain, I think you need to really engage with your supply chain, with your suppliers, uh, engage into dialogues, uh, proof points, understanding the business benefits, understanding the reason behind and the why uh, the code of conduct is important. Uh, just handing it over, signing an agreement uh, doesn't really help that lot. This is a collaborative approach and effort that every company needs to do if they want to work with their supply chain and make it sustainable. Uh, long term. As we move towards a global circular economy, how will this approach impact our everyday lives? Yeah, circular economy is a big one. Huh? There, and there are some major shifts uh, when we talk about circular economy. So in my world, we will move from sort of global value chains to local value chains, which means local material chains, uh, we need to loop materials, recycle them, and loop them back into production in a local context. Uh, see waste as a resource, set up the local productions with new technology to reach a, a, a good cost, but also high sustainability degree of, of the products there. Um, secondly, I think it's uh, going from ownership models to use models where you use the product when you need it. So renting and leasing uh, will have a much bigger or play a much bigger role in the future. And people will own less uh, stuff. Um, I mean, basically today it's financial insanity to, to own things and buy things. If you look at buying an, an, or owning a car, it stands still, stand still sort of 95% of the time just wasting money. If you can use it when you need it and pay for that, uh, I think both financially and sustainably, that would be a better solution. The challenge here is to get that uh, models to work for low value products. Um, but that will happen, that will happen. Um, and the third one is we need to go from extraction to regenerative models. So today, most of the material we use, we extract from earth and we, uh, yeah, cause, I would say, significant damage to uh, nature and to uh, the planet for a long time uh, going forward. And we need to, as companies, move more towards the regenerative models where we uh, put back more than what we take uh, from society, but also from the planet. Mm -hmm. I think those are the three major shifts I can see, and uh, each one of them will... Um, mean slightly different impacts on, on in our everyday, everyday lives. But there will for sure be uh, differences, but I don't think they have to be very big. What message do you have for businesses that are not already making sustainable changes? Well, I think I only have one message, message and that is sort of wake up. <laughs> uh, I mean, the two major uh, drivers of future business is, from it, in my mind, the digital transformation that we're in the middle of and the sustainable transformation. The first one, the digital one, is driven by technology. And the second, the sustainable transformation is driven by customers and consumers. So I, if you think that you can survive without meeting your customers' demand, uh, then please, yes, continue as what you're doing today. But if you're if you think that you need to meet your customers demand, then uh, you better uh, start transforming your company into a more sustainable one. Mm. So it's a survival issue. If you're not there, you will not be there for uh, in the next 10 years. 
group. Is there a one size fits all approach to sustainability or should businesses consider their specific sector before adopting sustainability strategies? Yeah, I think they need to. There is no one size fits all approach. There could be sort of one size fits all goals and ambitions like uh, regenerative, becoming regenerative or net zero. Um, but, but as a company, you really need to look into the industry or in, and, and what you are doing. So I would say, I mean, make a materiality assessment and understand where your highest impacts are as a company. Um, focus on those areas, uh, work with them really hard. Um, and then uh, you start your transformation there. So you address the biggest, um, uh, yeah, the biggest areas and where you have the biggest impact, negative impact, and then you start to sort of reduce that. 